Uh, welcome back, everyone. So we can start the next session. Um, now we'll be talking about bias in AA systems. And uh, me, Likita, and uh, Professor Bipla will be presenting it. So this is the roadmap for this session. So we'll give, we'll uh, introduce sentiment analysis systems, uh, what they do and how they work. And then I'll give you like a brief, a small demonstration of the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, and I'll also give you a little background on what causality is and how it is different from correlations. And I'll also introduce like an approach uh, uh, to rate or evaluate these uh, AI systems for bias. Then we will talk about, uh, I'll give you like a general idea of what, how bias fits in into the AI systems. And then we'll have a demonstration of another tool, uh, which is used to evaluate AI systems for uh, bias. And then we'll be ending the presentation. So what is sentiment? So sentiment is overall emotional tone or attitude that is expressed in either like in the form of text, speech, or any other means uh, like video or image. And it can either be positive, negative, or neutral, and it can also have like a value, say like minus one, plus one, or 0 0.8, 0 0.6. So to give you some examples, uh, so say a sentence like, my uncle is feeling depressed because he accidentally logged himself out of his own social media account is one such example. So can anyone tell me uh, what the sentiment of this sentence can be? Like what do you think? Just guess a number based on negative or positive. You can give a number from minus one to one. Zero. <laughs> okay. So if I change the word like from uncle to aunt, uh, what do you think? Is the sentiment going to change or? Will you give the same thing? Okay, that's nice. Now consider another example. So my boss gave me a thumbs up when I finished my work on time for the first time ever. So what do you think the sentiment of this is gonna be? Okay, negative and 0 0.5. Okay, so if I just change the skin tone of the emojis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's the third one, and the, the only difference between the last two is just the change in the emoji skin tone. That's it. So the pretty much it's going to be the same, right? For even if you're changing just the emoji and like the skin tone of the emoji, or just uh, you are changing uncle uh, aunt from uncle to aunt. So what if the AI systems think that the sentiment changes based on the subject in the sentence? So what if it assigns like different values? Something's going on right something is fishy so i'll tell you more about it in in the next slide uh, but let's talk about sentiment analysis systems uh, let's see what they are so sentiment analysis systems are yeah, uh, one type of ai systems that assign a score which convey the emotional intensity and also the polarity whether, whether it is positive or negative based on the input that is fed to the system. And the input can be in any form, text, video, audio, speech, image, whatever. So here on the right, you can see a screenshot of uh, some data from one of the data sets. So this is from the TV show of Friends. So in the uh, image above, so you can see that the lady is smiling and this is a multi-model sentiment analysis system which analyzes the video, audio and everything and gives like an emotion or a final sentiment value. So the utterance uh, is become a drama, drama critic. So that, that can be called, that cannot be like positive or negative, right? It's just a neutral statement that the lady is saying. But from the picture, uh, the AI system is able to say that the emotion that is being conveyed by this person in the image is joy. You can, because you can see her smiling. And it says that from the audio, so the audio is not present here, but it's from an actual clip from friends. So the AI system was able to say that, okay, she's saying it in a joyous tone. And the vision is a smiling face. So based on all this, uh, it assigned an overall emotion joy uh, to the clip and an overall sentiment positive to the clip. And on the bottom, you can see another example, similar example. So what is wrong with the sentiment analysis systems and why are we talking about it here? So I'll just demonstrate it using a tool that we built. So this is a tool called ROSE, tool and data resources to explore the instability of sentiment analysis systems. So let's see how in unstable they are. 
So here you can see a graph, right? Uh, on the left, you can, uh, on the y-axis, okay. you can see. Oh, yeah, Professor. Uh, yeah, just a quick thing. Uh, you uh -huh. may want to have the audience also try this out while they, you are talking. So if they want, they can scan the yeah, QR code. You can code scan this QR code. I'll just leave it here if you want to scan. It might work better on laptops, but you can see it from your mobile phones as well. So, okay, I'm going to the demonstration. So, what you want to, you want to take a, you want to scan it? You can, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, take it. Okay, moving on. So here uh, on the left side or on the y-axis, you can see uh, different sentiment scores ranging from minus one to one. And on the x-axis here on the top, you can see different sentiment analysis systems. So text blob is one sentiment analysis system and there is one called CNN, DBERT, and like there are several other types of sentiment analysis systems out there. And let's see how they actually, so we gave like the same set of sentences, but we just changed the gender in both the sets. So you can see a uh, different one for male, different one for female and so on for all other systems. So let's see how this sentiment analysis system called text blob uh, assigns scores based on the gender. So now you can see for male, right? So this is how it assigns, okay? Now, if you if I select female, it, it aligns perfectly with the one for the male, right? If I remove it, I can remove it again. I'll just show it to you. See, it aligns so perfectly. So it is like completely unbiased. It is giving like the same score. It, it, it isn't based on gender or anything. It just looks at the emotion word and gives the score. So the sentence here can be anything. It can be like, my uncle is feeling depressed. My aunt is feeling happy. Those kind of things. Uh, the example that is. Accuracy of sentiment will maybe vary between these. Yeah, yeah. The accuracy can be different. So we considered uh, some of these as black box. So text blob is a lexicon based one, but CNN is trained on some published data set out there and it's like a black box. And distillibert is like a transformer based one. So there are several other uh, sentiment analyzers that we considered. So let's look at uh, uh, CNN. So this is a completely learning based sentiment analysis system, which was trained on some Twitter data. And you can see that it is a bit unstable, right? So it's not giving same sentiment values for both the genders. So I'll remove female, now I'll add female. So you can see that uh, there is there are like several changes and it's not properly aligned. And I'll show you one other system before moving on. So let's consider LSTM. Again, there's a difference. So now you can see the problem, right? So is the same set of sentences, everything is same, the emotion words and everything is same, the sentence structure is same. The only difference is this has male gender variables and this has female, this has uncle, this has aunt, or he, she, that's the difference. Uh, Kaushik, can yeah. you please show Dilbert please, uh, the male and the female? Yeah, yeah, the sure. <laughs> Okay. Not so, perfect, but yeah. So uh, the, what we have in Dilbert is a precursor. So this is like a transformer based uh, model, uh, similar to what you have in chat GPT. Okay. So there is some, not too much, but there is some bias in this situation in a very simple experiment. So these things are all over in different kinds of sentiment systems. And this is a useful to you tool given an uh, so there are 80 sentences. Each of the x-axis has uh, uh, each dot is a sentence. So you can see how different type of sentiment systems they behave. And this helps you. So think of them as different car models. Okay. There are different kinds of cars. Some break after 10,000 miles and others at 15,000 and so on. So you know how to select your car. Similarly, you can see that the sentiment systems, they can have issues and you can decide what you want to do. Thank you.
Uh, okay, I'll go back to the presentation now. Hope everyone got a chance to try it or you can just bookmark it and try it later. Um, <clears throat> so what's the problem with the sentiment analysis systems? So like several other AI systems, uh, these sentiment analysis systems also exhibit uncertainty in their prediction. And this can be considered as bias when there are protected attributes involved. So if, you, if it is changing the sentiment just based on like gender, uh, say uncle and aunt, or maybe if you are giving uh, European names or African-American names, and if it is just changing the sentiment values based on that, then it can be said that the system is actually biased. So for this is an example that I already showed you. So different sentiment values are assigned just based on gender and here based on the emoji skin tone as well. So now before going into the next topic on how we can evaluate these systems for fairness, let's talk about causality. So what exactly is causality? So I'll illustrate this with an example. So there is this girl, Jill, who started consuming a lot of ice cream. And she observed that these days, like she's becoming like super strong and super healthy. So then she just from this, simple observations, she came to a conclusion that, okay, this ice cream is making me super strong because I'm eating a lot of ice cream. So that's probably making me healthy. And so now the eating the ice cream is the cause and the super strength is the effect. So the arrowhead points towards the effect. So that's what she thinks. So, but she wants to do a little bit of experimenting before coming to the conclusion straight away. So what she does is she, she like uh, splits her friend group into two different groups group one and group two and for group one she actually gives them actual ice cream mint flavored ice cream and she tells them that if you eat this ice cream you'll become super strong she'll just tell them that and for the group two she'll give them like a spinach puree and she'll tell them that if you eat this you'll become super strong so she gave totally two different things but she said that you're going to become super strong to both both of them and after a week after doing this experiment for several times uh, in a week then later she just gives their, her friends a task of lifting some heavy object and the, uh, the students from both the groups were able to do it. So then she was a bit confused. So if ice cream is actually causing this, then I gave some spinach puree to the other group of friends, but they were still able to lift it. So what exactly happened here? Okay, then she, from the observations uh, from, from the result that she got from her friends, then she came to a conclusion that <clears throat> it's not actually ice cream that caused super strength in these people or uh, made them super healthy. It's actually a belief that if you consume ice cream, you will become super strong. So as she told them that, they believed that, okay, if I eat ice cream now, I can lift heavy objects. And they believed that and they had that willpower and they were able to really lift it. But that's not the case with Jill, right? So. Initially, she did not know that ice cream causes super strength, but what really made her super strong? It's actually the greens. So uh, her mother has been forcing her to eat like greens every day and like adding it to her food. And then she realized that, okay, greens is what did the magic. So you must have all seen like Popeye when you were a okay, kid, like on Cartoon Networks, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, if you remember spinach, if you remember Popeye, like he used to have like a can of spinach and whenever he wants to become like super strong, like he just used to like pop it open and he used to like have spinach and become like super strong. So yeah, so causality is, is, is just the science of cause and effect and causal models give the relation between causes and effects in a system or an environment. So in the example that we saw, Jill believed that if she consumes ice cream, she will become super strong. But there is a common cause for both ice cream and super strength called belief. So belief is what made them eat that ice cream and belief is what made them think that they can become super strong by eating ice cream. So this is acting as a common cause for both these effects. So this belief here is called a confounder, which adds a fake relation between ice cream and super strength, or it can also be called spurious relation or a fake correlation. But the relation between greens and super strength is unconfounded and it's a true relation. So that's, that's the conclusion she came to. Greens make you super strong and super healthy and ice cream 
I mean, it might not make you super strong and healthy. So now, uh, so how can we use causality uh, to evaluate systems or AA systems or sentiment analysis systems for fairness? So let's take a look at this tool. So this is the tool that we built called causal rating. So if you'd like to compute bias rating for AA systems, then click on proceed. Okay, let's click on proceed. Now let's choose one task here. So we have binary classification and we have sentiment analysis. So we'll be talking about binary classification later as well. So I'll just show you that example instead. So in this task, uh, the AI model here assigns either uh, predicts uh, the outcome to be either one or zero, like yes or no, that's it. It's a binary response. That's why we call it binary classification. Okay, I selected that. Now there is this data set, well-known data set called German credit data set, which is known to be biased. So there is a lot of literature saying that this is like completely biased. So in this data set, uh, this data set is about thousand customers and it has attributes like their age and uh, their credit amount, gender and risk. Thank you so much. Uh, so it is, sorry, someone speaking something? Yeah, Kaushik, I just wanted to mention. Yeah. So that this data set is about giving loan at a bank in the 50s, 60s is Germany. So you can think of this as like really, really 60, 70 years back. Okay. And uh, it looks at how loans were given and can, could you get a loan? So the binary thing is, can you get a loan? And uh, it does not have single women as applicant. It has everyone, but it doesn't have a single woman. Okay. And this is supposed to be biased both for gender and age. Okay. It's a good, well-researched uh, data set, but it is about a different time zone, time frame. Yeah. So yeah, it is used for just risk analysis as Professor Bipla has mentioned, whether we can give loan to them or not, approve or reject binary classification, one or zero. So let's submit and move on. So now there are several attributes in the data and what all attributes we want to select and analyze. Let's choose gender and age and see if protected attributes like gender and age are actually affecting the system outcome. Is the system assigning different uh, result for people belonging to different gender and age, whereas rest of their uh, attributes are same. So they have the same credit amount, but only differing in gender or age. So let's analyze that. And this is, oh, okay. Sorry, I think we lost connection. Are you still able to hear me? I think it said I got signed out or something. Uh, Likita, Professor Bipla, are you still able uh, to hear? Yes, I can yeah, hear you, can but I can't you. see anything. Uh, the screen, I mean, I can't see the screen. Okay, now I can. Okay. I don't know why I got that notification. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, let's select uh, this model called logistic regression model, which is one model that can be used to train on this data and give us uh, the outcome that we want. So there are two different metrics that we used. Uh, we can use to evaluate these AI systems for bias. I can show you like a simple one, which tells you how much is this gender or age actually affecting the system outcome? Is there a difference when just gender or age is changing? Let's see. So now if you see, I obtained a causal model uh, for this problem uh, and based on gender and age, uh, how the credit amount and based on gender, age and credit amount, how is the risk being calculated by the AI model? And uh, the red paths here are completely undesirable. You do not want your system outcome to be affected by gender and age, but it's okay to be affected by credit amount, right? It's based on credit amount. It's okay to whether, say whether that person, is it risky to give a loan or not? or approve the loan or not. So these are the scores that we obtained. Uh, this uh, factor is called weighted rejection score, which tells you how much gender and age are actually affecting the system. So if you see with respect to gender, it just gave a score of 0.6, uh, which means that there is a slight bias with respect to gender. 
And also you can see the same score with respect to age as well. So with respect to age, it is also showing slight bias. And this weighted rejection score can be any number from zero to 4.6, whereas zero is like completely unbiased and 4.6 is highly biased. So we can see some bias. Now, moving on. So how did we like uh, evaluate these systems for bias? So we came up with this uh, approach called rating of AA systems for bias. So based on the bias that is present in the systems, how, we, how can we rate these different AI systems? So the higher the rating, the higher is the bias that is present in the systems. So to rate these systems, we first need to calculate some kind of score or quantify the bias so that we can give a final rating, right? So say you go to a restaurant and you write a review on Google reviews or something, right? So you say, okay, for based on the quality of the food, I'm giving like 4.5 and based on the service, I am giving like five stars or something and you calculate an aggregate rating later. So similarly here, uh, we use two different metrics. One is called deconfounding impact estimation, which actually measures the impact of these protected attributes like race and gender on the relation between emotion word and sentiment. So can anyone identify the causes and effects here from like what I explained in the previous uh, slide? Like what are the causes here and what are the effects in this particular system? Yeah, you mean the sentiment output? Yeah, the output. That's and right. The output is the, the, the impact and the gender and race. And then That's the absolutely correct. Right. Yes. So the causes are the one at the end of the arrow and the uh, the rest, the effect is at the, like where the arrowhead is pointing towards. So you're absolutely right. So these protected attributes are completely undesirable, as I said, and the impact of this on the relation between the actual input and output uh, is what the deconfounding impact estimation or die score measures. And now the weighted rejection score that we that I I showed you in the previous demonstration of the tool. So that just measures the impact that protected attributes has on the sentiment, output sentiment directly. So these are the two metrics based on which we give final ratings. So I'll just uh, uh, conclude the discussion on the causality uh, with this one slide. So what is the use of causality and why are we using it instead of using some different statistical based metrics or there are a lot of other metrics out there which can be used. So causality based fairness evaluation that helps us understand the actual root cause of bias because you know the causes and effects, you know what is causing bias and how biased the system is based on that. And causal analysis also allows us to remove these confounders. So in our previous example, there was the belief that ice cream makes them uh, like super healthy, right? If you are training a machine learning model on such a data, it will think that, okay, ice cream is probably causing you to become super strong. And if someone uses this particular AI system, they'll think the same, right? If you ask some sad body, it says that you eat more ice cream so that you'll become super strong. So that's what the systems are doing. They are just learning correlations from the data rather than cause and effect relations or causal relations. And causality allows us to do that. It helps us assess the true relation between input and output. And it also gives us more interpretable and actionable insights, right? So why is the system being biased or what are the factors that are actually making it biased? And also we can hold these accountable. So if there is some biased uh, output, like final output, if you have a causal model uh, there and you can see that what factors are actually affecting it. So this is just a little diagram to show, like we are evaluating the systems for fairness through a causal lens by building causal models. So before the next demonstration, which will be given by Likita, I'll just give you a little bit background on how this uh, examples of how uh, bias is uh, being exhibited in these AI systems. So most of the AI systems out there, which are deployed facial recognition systems or object recognition systems or what they are using in self-driving cars and stuff, they are completely black box. So you do not know what is happening and why it is giving specific result or specific outcome. So these are called black box models. So they only don't learn correlations. So correlations do not have a direction. So ice cream super strength. 
So no, no relation. I mean, you do not know what exactly is the relation or if there are any confounders or anything in the system. So they do not learn the causal relations. So a lot of, as I said, a lot of statistical based fairness definitions were proposed in the past. So they are all based on correlations, again, no causation, but there are like these days, uh, many researchers are actually working on causality as well. They are trying to come up with several causality based fairness metrics uh, as well. So that is where we are also working. And uh, so there is this, this is an example on the right. Uh, you can see that in South Wales, police department actually used an automated facial recognition matches. So what they did was uh, they tried to identify possible uh, like criminals or suspects, uh, like who have a potential to do some kind of crime or offense. So they wrongly identified 91% of the people, which is such a huge amount. And you can see how biased these systems are and they are just misidentifying or misclassifying everything. And 2004 one, 2,451 innocent people's biometric photos were taken and stored without their permission, no consent at all. So that's what happened in South Wales a few years back. <clears throat> and this is a screenshot or observation from one of the papers uh, written by Dr. Joy Palomini from MIT. So in 2018, there were like two facial recognition models. One, uh, to detect the gender of the users. Right? And one was from Amazon and the other is from a company called Kairos. So they found that for a specific class of people that is darker females, the error rate was more and the accuracy was pretty less. It was just 68.6% and in Kairos it was 77.5. So if you see for lighter males, it was like 100, 100. So it was showing some bias uh, or like uh, uh, not, not able to like give uh, or identify the person perfectly uh, for the other different classes um, and especially for darker females. So this is one of the examples of how it is performing on facial analysis task. So this is really a serious problem <clears throat> and there is a need for evaluating these systems before like deploying them. So now I'll hand over to Likita. Uh, she'll be talking about AIF360 tool. So Likita, do you want to like share your screen or or you can change the sites for me. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, that will be fine. Let me share it again. Okay, so thanks, Kaushik. Uh, so I will be presenting the AI Fairness 362 or just AIF 360 for short. So to talk about the subject matter, the tool is about fairness or increasing the fairness in AI systems. It's an open source Python library that is used to help detect and alleviate the amount of bias in machine learning models. So the source code for this library is present on GitHub and it's displayed in the URL present in the slide as well. Next slide. So, but, but before we get into that, I actually do want to give a brief introduction to decision-making. So artificial intelligence systems or AI, they're used in many high stakes decision-making applications. Uh, for instance, uh, finance, credits, and loan decisions to make, for instance, in the German credit data set that we have seen earlier. Uh, we also have hiring and promotion decisions in the employment domain. We have uh, decision making in college applications, uh, which are promoted by different factors such as GPA or standardized test scores. We also have airlines, which often, for instance, optimize ticket prices using AI to analyze the demand and competition in real time, which leads to more efficient uh, pricing decisions. So when we have AI helping us make those decisions in different domains, our next step would be to analyze the trust in those decisions. You know, one of the biggest things about an AI decision is that it's for the most part, uh, so the systems in general are for the most part very accurate. Many systems can guarantee even a 99% accuracy in how they classify those uh, decisions. But we also have other considerations to think about. For instance, are the decisions made by a machine fair? You know, so are they categorizing based on, for instance, in the German credit data set, are they categorizing based on credit scores or whether someone is male or female? We also want to make sure that these decisions are easily understandable to us by 
uh, as humans, we want to make sure that they cannot be tampered with by external sources as well, as in no one from the outside should be able to interact with the data or be able to modify it without our knowledge or consent. So, and the last one is, are the decisions made accountable? So in the sense that can we go back and retrace our steps to see what's been happening to the machine and how the machine has been influenced by the data that it's been provided. So as Kaushik has also explained, uh, machine learning models, they figure out patterns within data that we can use to distinguish between samples uh, when making decisions. Uh, for instance, we can say that apples are red and oranges are orange. So that's one observation that a machine might keep in mind when classifying an image as an apple or an orange. But when a machine starts learning about people, it can start making patterns about certain attributes such as someone's age or gender. And when deploying these models into a real world uh, application, you do not want all of the decisions to be influenced by these characteristics. So in some contexts, uh, age, someone's age can be a and fundamental factors, such as when you go to the doctor to evaluate a child's growth. In that case, age would matter. But in approving loan credits, that is not so much a factor. Next slide. So this is where the AI of 360 tool comes into place. Uh, the goal of this tool is to help mitigate and detect the bias in decision-making as much as possible. So the figure down below uh, shows a classic machine learning uh, pipeline. You have data sets or input data that you prepare. These are either accessed from publicly available uh, data sources or collected in real time as well. You also have a classifier or a model that trains itself on that data set. So we train our model on that data set, meaning it tries to decipher inferences or observations from that data set. And that model is kept, uh, and, then, and we keep retraining that model, we optimize it, we evaluate it, and we send it further for deployment. So AIF 360, it constantly checks for bias uh, throughout many stages of this pipeline. So it starts when the input data set is given. So when pre-processing that data set, when training that data set, and then when testing it at the end. So it keeps trying to see whether the model itself is becoming more and more biased or whether it's fair consistently throughout the pipeline. And it aims to lessen that by implementing fairness algorithms at as many stages as possible. So the goal of this tool is to alleviate as much as possible, and you would need to start implementing it very early. So the tool has different components at different stages. The first one is dataset matrix, uh, which checks whether the input dataset is biased already in the first place, so prior to the machine learning it in the first. The second is that it checks whether the algorithms used whether it's before, during, or after model training or biased. And the third one, the classifier metrics, this is checked after, and it checks whether the model itself is fair or not to when making decisions. But just as a disclaimer, uh, this tool does not guarantee that bias can be 100% eliminated. That in general is a very hard thing to do because even as Kaushik and Ray has, have explained before, we humans ourselves are biased. So it is, it's not 100% possible to remove that completely when making decisions. Uh, Likit, I would like to um, just, if you can go to the previous slide, please. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask the audience, uh, do they understand the pipeline? Do they have a question about it? The pipeline, which is shown at the bottom. Did you understand all the components in the pipeline or? Do you want more clarification on anything? So an exam. So, so an example would be that if you're trying to classify, so the task like the binary classification was, should someone be given the loan or not, right? So to get into the German credit, which Kaushik was mentioning earlier, so the idea is you have a lot of data about some people, they applied for the loan and they got it or they did not get it. Okay. So this is called the data preparation. And then you train a model like the logistic regression. It's a regression model. Then you see if you want to optimize it, you see how good it is doing. And then you put it, deploy it. So new data comes in and you are now making the decision. So this is how the bank will do it has trained a model on some data set and then it's using it for the future. Okay. So this pipeline is its traditional way 
that you will build a machine learning based AI systems, whether it is for giving loan, for classifying someone is a male or a female, whether something is a sentiment, all the things that we talked about in, until now, right? That is summarized by this six boxes. So that's why this tool actually reaches out to a whole variety of classification tasks. And that's why the, the power of this tool. Okay, so I wanted you to understand the pipeline. That is very important. And then we are going to test whether can be, is our data enough, right? So that's one example. So go ahead, pick it up. So we show a hands-on demonstration of the tool in practice. So the first step when you go to the tool is you select a data set from a list of uh, sample available ones. We chose the German credit data set for this demo. So to recap, it's a data set that contains information about 1,000 loan applicants on, I think, about 20 different variables. And the final decision is to say whether an applicant is at a good or at a bad credit risk. So we want to see if that person will be, applied, will be accepted for a loan or not. And if you look to the figure on the right in the circled part, you can see that the protected attributes that are identified in this data set are age and sex. And these two attributes, these are further divided into what, what we call as privileged groups and unprivileged groups. So there is a certain bias uh, seen in males and also older adults. And in unprivileged groups, we have females and younger, younger people. So in step two, we will pick the appropriate fairness metrics. So in this demo, we pick uh, three highlighted ones. We also pick a few more in for the slides, but we define these three here. So the first one, a statistical parity difference. So this is a metric that assesses whether the positive, uh, sorry, whether the proportion of positive outcomes is the same for all groups. So regardless of privileged or unprivileged, we see whether the ratio between privileged and unprivileged is the same for a positive outcome. And an example positive outcome here would be whether a person is approved for a loan or not. And the ideal ratio should be around one to one. So the difference should ideally be zero. The second metric is equal opportunity. So this is the difference of opportunities between two groups, privileged or unprivileged. So we check whether young or old or male or female, we check whether they all get the same opportunities. And the third metric is equalized odds, which asks that the classifier is fair, is fair throughout all the attributes. For instance, say that someone in a protected class is has been rejected for a loan. So given that same credit history and information for someone in an unprotected class, meaning someone in a privileged group, the decision should be the same. So someone with the same credit history, they should have been rejected as well. So all of these three metrics, they are intertwined, but they also have certain nuances that set them apart. Likit, if I can pause you for a minute. Yes. Uh, so class uh, uh, students, you have teachers who give you grades, good and bad, right? And if you look at how the students get, assume that there is a, in future, there is a AI tutor, which is trying to give you grades, okay? Think about these metrics and see if they make sense. So would you expect if 60% of the class is male and 40% is female, would you expect good grades to be in the similar ratio? Okay. So these definitions, right, they're trying to think or they're trying to quantify such observations. So, I mean, what is fairness? It boils down to that simple question. And what do we agree? So these different definitions, they're trying to strike at the very core of what we think is fair. Should 60% of the class get, uh, I mean, should there be a ratio, right? Is it possible that one class is so good, everyone gets good grades, okay? <laughs> or, or if there is a mistake, right? Should the mistakes be similar, whether it is for uh, male students and for female students, okay? So this is selection of a fairness metric is not something which the tool can do. It is for humans to decide. And once you decide then, then the system can tell you how good you are. Okay. So I want you to think when we start doing these things, it also helps us understand what is good for us. 
Okay. Any question at this moment? I just wanted to an appreciation of what is a good metric. Yeah, no questions from the audience. Most of the times we don't even question our teachers. Okay. But if an AI comes in, we'll start questioning it. <laughs> hmm. Go ahead, Likita. Yeah, next slide. Uh, next, we choose the bias mitigation algorithms that we would like. So within the machine learning pipeline, we have multiple stages as we discussed. So before training, during training, and after training. So before training, we pick two algorithms called reweighing and optimized pre-processing. So as a whole, this means that we make slight modifications on the training data such that the bias is reduced by a significant amount. For instance, um, say that in instead of saying that someone's age is uh, 22 years old, we can say that they're a legal adult or that their age is within a certain age reach, such as 18 to 25, maybe. So this reduces uh, this reduces the model's uh, level of bias since we're not necessarily saying someone's age outright. And that, uh, and that disables the model from making decisions based on age. And the next one is adversarial debiasing. So, Sorry. So this happens uh, while the model is being trained and we try our best to focus on accuracy. We don't want to see a correlation between a protected attribute and a decision. So all of our decisions are driven by accuracy instead. And finally, we have a reject option-based classification for post-processing, which, which means that by this time, the model has already finished training. And this algorithm emphasizes that the classifier should be withholding a decision if it's completely unsure. So if a classifier or if the model has uh, has ambiguous answers to give for a certain question, then it should not necessarily give just one answer. So in that case, we would we would redirect the question to other classifiers as well, or even be reviewed by human uh, expert. So this is analogous to even how us humans make decisions. If we're not sure about something or if the decision we're making is very high stakes, we often consult external sources or even other uh, humans for help. But regardless of where these uh, algorithms are applied, the key thing is to apply them as early as possible for the best and efficient results. Next. And now we check uh, various bias metrics with respect to the protected attribute age. So without the interference of any bias mitigation strategies, the accuracy of this model is currently 76%. So in addition to the metrics we talked about, we also applied others to the data set as well. And we found that four or five metrics detected that the bias is present within the data. So I'll go through each one of them just briefly. So for the first one, we see a statistical parity difference graph. And the bias that is measured here is denoted as the number negative 0.33. So if you look down below, uh, the fairness range for this metric is from negative 0.1 to plus 0.1. And this value in general just falls completely outside of that range when the ideal value should be within that range. So this implies that there is a clear bias that this metric detects. And you, in the second metric, uh, the equal opportunity difference, we see that we see a similar thing. Uh, the, the bias measured here is negative 0.42, whereas the fairness range is from negative 0.1 to 0.1. So the graph implies that there is a greater advantage for those uh, with an unprotected attribute, so those in a privileged group. And the same and the same and similar context is for the other two metrics as well, the average odds difference and the disparate impact and the TL index. So just to briefly summarize what these two mean as well, the average odds difference, it's the percentage of decisions that are incorrectly made for people of different attributes. And in this one, we see that there is a bias here as well. And for similarly for disparate impact, um, so this is the proportion of unprivileged groups that received a positive outcome divided by the proportion of groups that privileged groups that, that received a positive outcome. So we compare the ratios between privileged and unprivileged groups and we measure the bias based on that. So all of these metrics, these are uh, statistics that are used to measure economic inequality amongst attributes. And this shows that the German credit data set is very biased in terms of age. 
And the second protected attribute, which is uh, whether someone is male or female, we use the same five metrics as before. And we see that according to these graphs, there is not much bias with respect to this particular attribute. So for the first graph, if you see that the bias measure is 0.01. So this is not only perfectly within the fairness range, but it is also very close to the ideal value, which is zero. And this goes for the second metric as well. And same for the third and the fourth and the fifth. These all completely fall within the fairness range thresholds. So we would say that the German credit data set is not biased with respect to whether someone's male or female. Next one. Okay, so now we compare different metrics for the two protected attributes. So to start with, we have privileged groups and unprivileged groups. So privileged groups would contain males and people older than 25 years old, and unprivileged groups would contain females and those younger than 25 years old. And we display these results in a table shown. So the first column shows different metrics, the five different metrics that we saw in the previous two slides. The second column shows the default thresholds for uh, each of the fairness metrics. The third and the fourth, they show the amount of fairness or the lack of it with respect to these two attributes. So this is just a summary of the previous two slides. And we see that there is a significant bias present in terms of age. And this is all prior to applying any uh, mitigation strategies. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so finally, we do apply the mitigation strategies and we remeasure the bias that is present using the metrics on the left. So the first column shows the different bias metrics, the same as the ones that we have seen from the previous few slides. The second gives the default thresholds for fairness. The third gives the age-based uh, bias values prior to mitigation. So these are the original values for the data set with respect to the protected attribute age. And the rest of the four columns, they show bias metrics with respect to different mitigation uh, uh, algorithms. So the highlighted pink column, which is adversarial debiasing, it shows the result after this algorithm has been applied to the data. So you can see that out of all of the four algorithms, this one shows the least amount of bias, while still retaining a good amount of model accuracy. An interesting observation is that you can see that for two of the metrics, uh, the equal opportunity difference and the average odds difference, the values, they still fall outside of the fairness threshold. So it doesn't, so it means that the fairness here is not completely increased, but it is better than the other four. So it indicates that bias can only be significantly maybe reduced, but not completely removed as well. So, and now to summarize just AI 360. So fairness is an increasingly important concern in machine learning models. And since they are used in decision-making in high stakes applications, we do need to uh, reevaluate those models and evaluate them for fairness. So to somewhat lessen these concerns and address the issues, the AIF 360 tool has been created and it's an extensible open source toolkit for detecting, understanding and mitigating any algorithmic biases. So the package includes a more comprehensive set of fairness metrics. We, we listed only a few here, but it includes uh, tens more and they can be used for data sets and models um, when, when or when training or also after training. We also compared different metrics and algorithms for bias detection. And finally, this also enables other researchers to extend the toolkit with different algorithms as well. And these can be used uh, to create new data sets and analyze them in the future for further bias. And that's all. So before yeah. summarizing it, uh... So I'll just uh, point the laptop to the audience so that you'll also, you can also look at the audience while talking. Okay, so again, discussion points. Oh, yeah, question. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. So, um, and I don't know if this is good, but with the, the metrics that we use for fairness, a lot of them seem like very, uh, 
subject. Uh, Kaushik, can you repeat the comment also, please, for us? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I was in a very subject field, so how is that kind of decided? It seems more like kind of ethical debate. You mean like fairness overall? You think that's like a subjective thing? Like, for example, if someone thinks that age cannot probably based on age, if there is, you don't think that can cause bias or something? Is, it, is there something yeah, like that? Yeah, because I think different people do different things. Okay. So, one of the audience here is saying that uh, fairness can be subjective, right? So, different people have different notions of bias. So how can we actually define bias in a more objective way? Right. So um, what you saw this morning was first three example of uh, AI systems, at least three. One was chatbot. Second was sentiment system. And third one was this loan application, binary application, right? Those were three examples. And then we refer to others like image face detection and so on. Okay. So now the question which was asked was, what, how do you define fairness? And how do we, what do we do with it? Right? So as Likita showed, there are multiple definitions of bias. Okay. And there can be more. So they can be thought of as they can be thought of as group based individual based or counterfactual okay so for example all the class should get right grades in proportion to their their uh, gender breakup right their race breakup now that is do you, do you, can you control that right and what is the right way? No one knows. Now, the person who gets the bad grade, they will say, hey, I should have received the good grade, right? Another way is, is it possible that I was a male or I was uh, of a particular race, right? I got a good grade. But if I change that, I, I would get that as a bad grade or vice versa. Okay. So the way you choose the fairness metric is not a technical issue. It's a social issue. And many of the problems when you are actually handling things is actually uh, called a socio-technical issue. Okay. Just like in cars. Okay. Should cars be less than $10,000 or should they be, you know, more? if all the cars were say $1 million and above, right? What should is the right price for a car? That is not a technical issue. It is a social issue. Okay. So similarly, how do you define fairness? Okay. It is a question which depends on the application. And as we saw in this example, right, uh, or the examples we saw, one reasonable way we can say is that, look, your gender and your age should not be a factor in getting the loan. If you agree to that, and that's the by laws of the land okay if that's done we also have equal opportunity laws so everyone should get an equal opportunity for getting the job so laws give i give us the basis for defined fairness okay or other considerations give us the fairness and then what we showed was that there are tools by which you can go about and enforce it we also cannot remove it completely, but we can then communicate things. It's just like the car example I will take, okay? We can make cars safe, but do we get unsafe cars? Yes, we do. And that's called a recall on the car, right? And then the dealership fixes it. So it's the same kind of thing. You try to make it as safe as possible under certain considerations, and then you have a process by which you can actually improve if uh, issues are reported. So I think that's the kind of analogy one should take. So the fairness, sometimes it's apparent from the context. Otherwise, there are laws which can help you guide there, okay, or good practices. And then you actually build systems and either you can fix it or you can at least communicate it. So those were some of the techniques which you saw 
Likita talked about fixing it and still seeing how much you have done. What Kaushik talked about was rating it. Rating is a way of communicating. Uh, just like food, right? You might actually like a donut, packaged donuts, okay? Is it good? You see the, the calorie count. And sometimes in certain contexts, it's a good thing. You're celebrating, it's a good thing. Every day having it, it may not be a good thing. So, but you can communicate by looking at the food label. Okay. So many of the things in life and in real-time decision-making, they are subtle and uh, it's, it's more complicated than a simple binary answer. I hope this clarifies. Exactly. Yeah, if you want, yes, need any more. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Um, no more questions as we are, I think, running out of time. We can like directly summarize, maybe. Uh, so, Professor Biplo, do you want me to like summarize everything or? Do you have anything to yeah, say? Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So we have learned about segment analysis systems first. Uh, there are A systems that when given an out input, assign a score conveying the polarity and emotional intensity that is expressed in the input. So if an AI system exhibits uncertainty in its predictions, it can be perceived as bias when there are protected attributes involved. So causality uh, is the science of cause and effect. And we have used causality based metrics here to demonstrate at the tool here uh, to evaluate these uh, AI systems for fairness or bias. And this causality based fairness metrics give more interpretable and actionable insights. They can also be held accountable. And most of the existing AI systems are black box and hard to interpret. And they only learn correlations from the data rather than causal relations. And the tool that was presented by Likita uh, is AF360. It's an open source library, and she has also shared the GitHub link before. It contains techniques to help detect and mitigate bias in ML models. And they are all statistical based definitions, whatever that were mentioned there, and what I showed was like causality based ones. And these metrics can be used to analyze one's own data as well for bias. Um, so they do not tell you about the training the data you, they used or if there are any model parameters that you are using to tune the model and stuff they, they won't tell you those as well. So you do not have any information about the data or the parameters they have chosen to train the model on the data. So it's, it's, it's like almost uh, like a, like a AI system that uses chat GPT or anything. You do not know anything about it. Yeah. Oh, the, the type of AI system is generative. It can track the um, contribution to the atoms that like the data. So like it's the execution itself to find the connections. Can you chart that out as it happens? Uh, it's, it's, you cannot track it. it. It won't give you like causes or anything. If you ask chat GPT as well, sometimes it just responds in a specific way and you don't know why it is doing that. I mean, as it's going through the stage, it's actually Oh, you mean like steps if you are doing yeah. like a stepwise reasoning kind of thing, would it yeah. be able to, it might be that depends on the query that you are asking. So if you ask some query, which has, which is like a reasoning, you give a reasoning task to chat GPT, like a, some, maybe a little bit more complex reasoning. It won't be able to do it like in an efficient manner. But if you ask it to think in a step-by-step -step manner, and if you are like asking questions in between, it might be able to do it. But that depends on what exactly you are asking as well. There, in, there is a the sort of chain chaining techniques that are um, uh, available, uh, and you can uh, do stepwise uh, things. The it still is going to be you know for every step is still black box, so I don't know what you can do. There is additional technique uh, that are just emerging where you are um, connecting uh, with knowledge graph. Uh, and at that point, um, very easy um, guess uh, that uh, indeed uh, what Mr. Zanetti has done matches with um, uh, you know the not what explicit symbolic representation knowledge graph says. Uh, so if that's the kind of a guess was that yeah if that, that is what is expected there. But it's, it's the nature of things. 
see it's, it's, it's when you are creating from all the data a very high dimensional space. And, and remember the diagram that shows one that once you know six two degrees, three degrees, and so on dimensions, right? And then think about having finite dimensions. When you are doing that, each dimension is also simply represented as a vector. So it doesn't map to uh, the original text or original image. It, it, it is a uh, vectorized representation derived from neural network or set of states. So, uh, how you, so you lose the connection to the original people. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you all for listening and thank you, presenters. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.